Carter, who is part of the Extended Epistemology Project here at the moment, and he's going to talk to us about group knowledge and epistemic defeat. And thanks a lot for agreeing to do this now. Thanks a lot, Ian. All right, so just a quick bit of background about the talk. So I'm kind of jumping into slightly new territory here. Um, traditionally, epistemological questions, we think of them as concerned with individual beliefs and individual belief forming processes. And we have a pretty reasonably good grip on what we're talking about when we say individual knowledge, even though we argue about what it involves. Collective knowledge or group knowledge is quite a different type of deal. Um, so here's a, here's a very unobjectionable sort of deflated conception of group knowledge that is not going to be in a philosophical interest in the talk we're going to get. So it's called the summativist conception of group knowledge. Um, on this proposal, we might say that Swedes think that Volvos are the best cars. But there's a way of reading that claim where Swedes yeah, believe that Volvos are the best cars. There's a way of reading that claim where really all we mean is that most individuals in Sweden, maybe over 55 or 50% believe that Volvos are the best cars. And this essentially just reduces what we attribute as group belief to just a bunch of an aggregate of individual beliefs. There's a different type of attribution we make when we say, the jury was the jury justified. What did the FBI know prior to 9-11? It's not so clear in this case that we can reduce the type of epistemic state we're interested in to just an aggregate of individual beliefs. And this is the type of epistemic state that's studied in collective epistemology um, when we talk about group knowledge and group beliefs. So how do these two relate to one another? Awkwardly, a lot of people who are interested in group knowledge and specifically we'll call them collective epistemologists um, are interested in group knowledge for reasons that have not very much to do with the sort of Gettier analyzing that mainstream analytic philosophers are interested in. It's considerations to do with artificial intelligence, distributed cognitive information systems. And a lot of these people haven't really thought about very carefully, Jennifer Lackey being a serious exception, some of the puzzles in mainstream individual epistemology that could apply to the notion of group beliefs. Um, similarly, a lot of people working in mainstream epistemology, just their eyes will glaze over when you say group knowledge and think, well, what, what is that about? Um, so what Jennifer Lackey has done and what I'm going to attempt to do and sort of follow in her footsteps with respect to the notion of epistemic defeat is to raise some puzzles for concepts of, for particular positions about what group knowledge involves that are based on puzzles that arose originally at the individual level. Um, here's going to be the structure of the talk. I'm going to be embracing throughout a guiding insight that Lackey takes on board and which I take on board and I think this is pretty plausible. So this is going to guide the discussion. The idea that there's sort of an ex-ante constraint up front on any plausible account of group knowledge that it could be in principle defeated through ordinary mechanisms of epistemic defeat. And I'll say a little bit about what those mechanisms are in a bit. But this is the idea. Um, it's, it's bad news for an account of group knowledge if it can't make any sense of how knowledge could be defeated through ordinary mechanisms of defeat. So the structure of the talk will have sort of four main things I'm going to try to do. The first thing is pretty simple. I'm just going to distinguish between this radical account of group knowledge that Lackey has recently targeted in a paper that she contributed to a volume that we edited here for Phil Issues. Um, she has a paper called Socially Extended Knowledge. And she, char she challenges a conception of group knowledge that's been defended by Alexander Berg. She thinks that it's bad for a number of reasons. One of those reasons that it can't make any sense of epistemic defeat. I'm going to focus on that. Um, but first, anyway, I'm going to distinguish between these two types of group knowledge in virtue of what they tolerate epistemically of individuals in the group. I'm going to distinguish between this radical version that she attacks and this more moderate view that actually quite a few people in collective epistemology endorse and which she doesn't attack. I'm going to then show why Lackey thinks that the radical view the view that Alexander Burr endorses can't make any sense of epistemic defeaters, but that the moderate view can. After that, I'm going to argue, and I'm going to spend a lot of time doing this after I set things up like that. I'm going to show why, a point that I think Lackey has overlooked, the moderate view that's accepted by a lot of people working in a collective epistemology also can't make any sense of epistemic defeat. And this is a prima facie pretty bad deal for orthodoxy and collective epistemology if it can't make sense of this. Um, and I'm going to give arguments, two arguments, one that it can't make sense of psychological defeat and another that a more moderate view can't make sense of normative defeat. And I'm going to conclude by suggesting some ways to try to save the moderate view. So that's the structure of the talk. 
So firstly, I want to now distinguish right, between two different types of group knowledge. And there's different ways you can distinguish these accounts. I'm going to do it on the basis, as Lackey does, which is particularly relevant for discussing defeat. Um, distinguish them on the basis of what they will epistemically tolerate. So here's one view. We can say a group G can know that P even when not a single individual member of G knows that P. That might sound crazy at first, but that's actually a view that a lot of people in collective epistemology will sign up upon. Now, notice that, and I'm going to be referring to this position as SEKM. This position does allow for weaker epistemic requirements on its individuals. And it, for instance, that they jointly accept or jointly commit or believe the proposition that P. An example you can imagine of, uh, by the way, this is endorsed particularly by Margaret Gilbert, Hackley Tolson, and some others, will all accept for different reasons the idea that a group can know a proposition even if it's not the case that any particular individual, one of its members, knows the target proposition. A crew of a ship, for instance, might be able to, we might say the crew knows the current location of the ship, even if not a particular individual knows, so long as they're all coordinating in a particular reliable way based on some sort of agreement. So this, this, this will sound like a crazy. Um, I think you'll see a case which makes it seem not entirely as crazy. So this call this SEKR, Socially Extended Knowledge Radical. This is what Alexander Berg defends. A group G can know that P even when not a single individual member of G is aware that P. And by aware, I'm not using aware in the Williamsonian sense of like a factive mental state operator. Um, I'm following Lackey and using aware as like have any clue about P. In fact, could just as well be dead. And in fact, in the case that's given, we'll match some people that are dead and satisfy that requirement that way. Um, now, this, this, I won't unpack this too much further, but here's what Alexander Bird says. He thinks that all a social structure has to do to be a candidate social knower is have characteristic, and this is a very condensed version, characteristic propositional outputs and characteristic mechanisms that ensure the reliability of the propositional outputs, which are themselves the inputs for social actions or for social cognitive structures, including the same structure that produces the output. Now, notice that nowhere in this discussion is a requirement that any individual have any particular beliefs or knowledge. Now, the bird wants to allow, I mean, you can imagine a crew of a ship all agreeing that we're going to coordinate in certain ways. Call that a structured group. Bird wants to allow that unstructured groups can satisfy what he calls group knowledge by satisfying SEKR, and particularly his positive proposal that I just summarized there. Um, indeed, even if no one has any beliefs at all that's a member of this unstructured group, such as the scientific community, he allows the scientific community to be a relevant group. Um, this, is probably, this should be a bit confusing at this point because it's hard to make sense of why anyone would, want, would think that a group could know a proposition if none of its members is even has a clue about the proposition. Here's the case that Berg gives that supports SEKR, and this is a case that Lackey uh, makes an addition to and then attacks in some detail. It's pretty interesting. This case, we'll see what you think about it. I won't try to prejudge you. I know I've already said the, the proposal sounds crazy but I won't try to prejudge you any further. So it's the case of Dr. N. So Dr. N is working in mainstream science, but in a field that currently attracts only a little interest. He makes a discovery, writes it up, and sends his paper to the Journal of Exology, which publishes the paper in the normal peer review process. Now, pay attention to this part. A few years later, at time T, Dr. N has died. All the referees, of the paper for the journal and its editor have also died or forgotten about the paper. The same is true of the small handful of people who actually read the paper when it was accepted. Now, things aren't looking very good right now, are they? A few years later, Professor O is engaged in research that needs to draw on the results and Dr. N's field. She carries out a search in the ind indexes and comes across Dr. N's discovery in the Journal of Exology. She cites Dr. N's work in her own widely read research, and because of its importance to the new field, Dr. N's paper is now read and cited by many more scientists. And you can probably see where Bird's going to go with this. He says the scientific community knew the results of Dr. N's paper all along. 
despite there being a period of time where everyone who knew about it, or indeed was even aware of the result, was dead. Nonetheless, throughout, the scientific community knew. Raise your hand if you have some sympathy for this suggestion. All right. Now, as Bird puts it, it seems irrelevant that Dr. N and others who had read the original paper died or forgot about it. What's relevant, he thinks, is that the discovery was in the public domain, available through the normal channels to anyone such as Professor O, who needed it. Um, and of course, Bird thinks that this is a case that also satisfies the other positive conditions I mentioned a couple of slides ago. So Bird's diagnosis in short of the case of Dr. N clearly shows that he takes the radical SEKR to be true. The group can know that P even if not a single individual is aware of P. Can't be aware of it, they're all dead. Follow this so far? Now, Lackey is not well impressed, um, and let's just rehash again what I mentioned at the very outset. There's, a, there's an ex-ante constraint, we think, on any plausible group of, account of group knowledge. Let's say that it has to at least be, in principle, defeated through ordinary mecha mechanisms of defeat. Now, Lackey takes this insight in the service of saying that this view that we just considered can't do that. Um, and just to, just to reiterate why this is bad, if it can't, I mean, there, there's one side that might say, wait a minute, if it can't be defeated, it's even stronger. It's somehow better. But that's not the right way to think of it. I mean, it would be very odd indeed, right, if group knowledge and justification were somehow undefeatable. Um, imagine the idea of having individual knowledge that just couldn't be defeated no matter what you come to learn. It seems like we're no longer talking about knowledge. And to the extent that we want to take seriously the collective epistemologist's proposal that this is group knowledge, it's got to be the sort of thing that can be defeated. Um, and indeed, this is exactly what Lackey thinks that Bird's strong view entails this result that it can't be. Now, in order to appreciate this point, I'm going to make it clear exactly a very simple model of what a defeater is. Uh, I won't talk about this for very long. I just want to get a very simple picture so that in the rest of the talk you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So a, there are roughly two types of defeaters. There's psychological defeaters, and this is Lackey. I think she did her PhD dissertation on defeaters because in most of her papers she has excellent discussions of different uh, varieties of defeat. And here's a really compact way to put it. So we could say there's a psychological defeater um, present when there's a doubt or a belief that is had by S which indicates that S's belief that P is either false or unreliably formed or sustained. I'm going to give you a quick example of each. So suppose that I'm in the Nakatomi Tower and I'm on, and I hear the beeps of the elevator and I think that I'm on the 13th floor. And then I hear, and so I form the belief I'm on the 13th floor and then of this tower. And then I hear someone say, did you know that there, there is no 13th floor of the Nakatomi Tower? Well, if I hear that, that is a belief that I now have, which defeats, um, it counts against, it counts against the truth of the belief that I currently have. This is an example of a rebutting defeat. Um, and it doesn't matter, by the way, whether or not that belief is actually true. Maybe someone's a joker, or just lying, saying that there's no 13th floor. Psychological defeaters defeat in virtue of being had by S, regardless of their truth value or epistemic status. This is as Black is laying down. Um, so as long as I have that belief that there's no 13th floor, that's rebutted, it's undercut by, or sorry, it's defeated by rebutting my target belief. So here's another variety, an undercutting defeater. So imagine that I believe that that's, I just really think that I see Elvis, and I believe maybe he's alive, and I think that it's clear and distinct. And then I come to find out that the iron brew that I've been drinking has peyote in it, that I might think, well, uh, Heck, all right, maybe that, maybe that is an Elvis. I no longer have reason to think that my belief is reliably formed or sustained. So this is an example of an undercutting defeater. Um, so psychological defeaters, right, can be both rebutting or undercutting. Now there's also normative defeaters. Normative defeaters don't function by defeating your target belief in virtue of being hacked. Rather, normative defeaters are doubts or beliefs that S ought to have and indicate that S's belief that P is either false, in which case it would be rebutting, or unreliably formed or sustained. And they function in virtue of being beliefs that you ought to have. Now, defeaters can be defeated, right? In the case of the person who tells me that there's no 13th floor of the Nakatomi Tower, I could then have that defeater defeated if someone then says, but this guy has been telling everyone 
this in every tower. Um, this person is a liar. Well, then I'm back to where I started. Um, the idea is that undefeat, undefeated defeaters can defeat knowledge and justification. And so this is a this is the simple picture that we'll be working with. There is some debate about how misleading defeaters work, but we'll just table that and think about these two main varieties. So Lackey now runs a twist on the case of Dr. N in the service of arguing that it can't make any sense of psychological defeat. She says, suppose that because and I mean, she's exploiting the point, by the way, that once Dr. N and everyone who's read the paper dies, right, a lot of stuff can happen in the scientific community. This is something that uh, she draws out and suggesting a particular thing that could happen. Um, some of it's bad. So suppose that because of their ignorance of Dr. N's published paper, many members of the scientific community come to believe that not D. By the way, I didn't define this, but let's let D is just like let that represent Dr. N's discovery. So like, let's just think of Dr. N's discovery as just a proposition. So many members of the scientific community come to believe that not D, that T2. Indeed, suppose that at scientific conferences and workshops, there's often collective agreement among the participants that not D, against Dr. D's discovery, which is still in that obscure journal that everyone who's read it is dead. So because of this, the members of the scientific community act on Nandi by, for instance, asserting that Nandi in lectures and published work, approving cancer drugs, yada yada, etc., that take Nandi for granted. Now Lackey says that it's obvious that in her little twist edition, and to be clear again, her case edition is her own version of a twist on the Dr. A case. She thinks it's obvious that the scientific community believe that not P. And she says that it is a, quote, classic instance of a rebutting psychological defeat, which defeats the would-be knowledge and justification and virtue of being believed by the scientific community who's acting on not deed, and counting against the truth of the target proposition. So, well, who thinks that seems pretty plausible, that there's a, what would be sort of the group analog of a psychological defeater present in this case? Pretty compelling suggestion. So it looks like it's bad news, right, if S-E-K-R, the radical view, can't make any sense of that. Now, I call this a, a poison choice. Um, at this point, it looks like whether you say yes, you know, whether a proponent of S-E-K-R, the radical view, says that in addition, group knowledge is psychologically defeated, whether they say answer yes or no to that question, it's bad. Um, and obviously, if that's the case, then we would conclude that SEKR can't make good sense of psychological defeat. So, again, let's, let's pose this question. This is how this would work. Let's pose this question to the proponent of the radical view. It says you can, group can believe, can know that P even if no individual is aware of the P. In addition, is group knowledge psychologically defeated? Well, you want to say yes, because it seemed like it was, right? The scientific community is acting and taking for granted not being. So, if you say yes, the problem is there's two really bad things that are implications of saying yes. Um, one is a skeptical objection. The idea is that if you allow every time the scientific community acts as if P or seems to believe that P, there's enough dissent within science that we have very little scientific knowledge, quite, quite a bit less than we would think that we have. So the idea would be, here's the amount of scientific knowledge that we plausibly have. And maybe here's how much we would have if we allowed knowledge to be defeated any time situations occur as they occur in uh, her case of addition. So one would be a skeptical objection. Too easy to defeat. Overgeneral, overgeneralizes. But even if you get around that, there's also a pretty interesting arbitrariness objection that Lackey raises against the strong version, which is this. Notice that the strong version of the group knowledge thesis is saying that a group can know that P even if no individual is even aware that P. This means that group knowledge doesn't intervene on individuals' mental states. Now, what's interesting here is that if the proponent of SEKR says, yeah, group knowledge is defeated in the case of addition, then it looks as though individuals' mental states can contribute negatively toward the group epistemic status, but not positively, and that seems epistemically arbitrary. See how this works? Looks like individuals' mental states could defeat group knowledge, but couldn't positively contribute to it. So that's bad. So it looks like even though yes is the plausible thing that a proponent of SEKR should seem to want to say in the case of addition, 
looks like they're kind of in trouble either way. So maybe they could just say no. Okay, say, well, these are, these are bad results, so let's say, uh, say no, group knowledge is not actually psychologically defeated in Lackey's twist case of addition. Now here Lackey thinks there's either two reasons one might offer in the service of advancing the idea that group knowledge is not defeated in that case. One would be to say that, well, a group can know that P even though a group believes that not P. That would obviously be one way to, if you endorse that and defended that, then you could say, well, there isn't a psychological defeater present. Now, Lackey doesn't like that. She says, this strategy, in effect, exempts groups from norms governing rationality and thus removes them from the realm of the rational altogether. Um, it's easy to sympathize with this suggestion. Think about that. If a group can know that P even though they believe that P, imagine that at the individual level. Um, it seems to leave one scratching one's head about what rational norms would look like if this is permissible. Of course, another way that you could say no to the question of, in addition, is group knowledge psychologically defeated, is just deny that belief is a necessary condition on knowledge. This is something that I believe Eric Schwitzgabel and Blake, Blake and Schwitzgabel in a recent newspaper have argued, I believe, for this type of a position. A belief isn't actually a necessary condition on knowledge. Lackey thinks that this is a bad position as well. It's very counterintuitive to say that belief isn't a necessary condition of knowledge. But regardless of what I'm going to say at the individual level, there seems to be a special problem for groups that are going to go this route. One is that um, it's going to fail to preserve any distinction between knowing and being in a position to know. If a group denies that belief is a necessary condition on knowledge. So, Yikes, it looks like at the end of the day, uh, the radical view can't make sense of psychological defeat. Now, Lackey doesn't particularly talk about normative defeat in the addition case. She simply says it can't make sense of psychological defeat. That's bad enough, and uh, that's not something that faces the moderate proposal. I'm going to quickly remark about why, in Lackey's discussion, she suggests that the moderate proposal is not going to run into the same type of problem. Um, just think about it. Can, can the moderate view, it says, the moderate view again, says a group can know the P even if no individual member knows the P, so it tolerates less. Um, can this group do, can this position do better than the more radical position in the addition case? Well, yeah, I mean, consider that Lackey's poison choice that we considered was premised upon the radical view's controversial ruling that knowledge is actually present in addition. Well, SEKM, the more moderate view, isn't committed to saying this. They say it's, you know, it's true that a group can know the P even if no individual member knows the P, but they can allow other weaker epistemic requirements, and they're not, they're not committed to saying that a group can know the P even if no one is aware, no individual is aware of the P. So the poison choice doesn't face the moderate view as Lackey sees it, because the moderate view doesn't have to say that knowledge is present in addition. So that's a simple way out. Um, doesn't really face the problem. So she takes it, by the way, Lackey actually also makes reference to a number of other arguments against the more radical position, including arguments that have to do with the relationship between knowledge and action. Um, and in fact, she focuses even more on the knowledge-action argument against this radical view than she does on her defeat argument. I just think the defeat argument is especially interesting, and this is the one that I wanted to run with. So she stops her argument right there. It only applies to the strong view. I'm going to go further, and I think that, uh, I'm going to argue now that the moderate view can't adequately be saved or squared with ordinary thinking about psychological defeat. Um, in fact, I'm going to argue that the more moderate view, the one that is actually endorsed by a lot of collectivist epistemologists, can't make any sense of either psychological or normative defeat. Now, I'm not going to reference the addition case that Lackey used against the radical view. I'm going to give my own kind of argument. So I'm going to say the more moderate views really not that much better off than the radical view, given a lot of weak assumptions that are probably going to be embraced by a lot of people who support uh, collective knowledge. So the argument that I'm going to give comes into, sh comes into form once two background claims are accepted. And I'm going to make very clear what these background claims are. Why I think that most people that embrace SEKM, the moderate view, are going to accept these background claims, I'm going to show how pretty simply it 
leads to the result that you can't make sense of psychological defeat on the moderate model. So the first background claim I want to consider is a very standard way to think about the kind of joint belief that's present in cases of group knowledge. This is the joint acceptance account of group belief. So that's going to be one background claim. Another background claim is a claim about the connection between group actions and actions of its members, which is a principle that Lackey calls the group member action principle, which he actually talks about in the service of making an entirely different point, but which I'm bringing to bear on an argument that's defeat-based. So I'm going to be specific now about what these background claims are. Here's the joint acceptance account of belief, which is the most prevalent approach to group belief within collective epistemology. So the joint acceptance account of belief, call this JAP. I'll just be referring to it as JAP. This is what I mean when I say JAP. A group G believes that P, if and only if the members of G jointly accept that P. The members of G jointly accept that P when the members conditionally commit to accept that P. Members of G conditionally commit to accept that P when each is committed to acting as if P provided the others do. Now this is the core of a position that's been defended with some different modifications over the years by Margaret Gilbert. Um, and as Lackey remarks, this is, this is sort of the standard way to talk about group beliefs amongst those people in collective epistemology who embrace the idea that there can be group beliefs. We'll see that not everyone actually thinks that there can be. Some people, there's a vocal minority that are rejectionists who claim that there aren't actually group beliefs, it's actually group acceptances. And I'll discuss that carefully in a bit. But for right now, just bear in mind that this is one of the background claims I'm going to use in making my argument that most people who embrace the moderate view are kind of in serious trouble making sense of psychological defeat. So that's one. The second background claim is a claim about the kind of connection between groups and their members. This is a quote I'm giving by List and Pettit who say that the things a group agent does are clearly determined by the things its members do. They cannot emerge independently. In particular, no group agent can form intentional attitudes without these being determined in one way or another by certain contributions of its members. And so no group agent can act without one or more of its members acting. So if we're a group, we can't just do nothing and then have our intentional attitudes start changing. So I'll be referring to this principle. Here's a pithy way to put this idea of the features in the list and Pettit quote is GMAP, the group member action principle. The idea is that for every group G in act A, G performs A only if at least one member of G performs some act or another that causally contributes to A. Well, that looks pretty plausible, doesn't it? Especially people who are sympathetic to physicalism in the philosophy of mind might think that our mental states can't change unless there's some change in our biological basis of the mental states. Um, so this is essentially the, those are essentially the two ideas. So JAB, the joint acceptance account of belief, and this principle. I'm saying once, once a proponent of SEKM, the moderate view, is on board with these two background claims, they're going to look stuck with the result that if group A believes not P, it's not the case that A retains its group belief that P. Now, if you think about that, if, if, I'm, if it's true, right, that a proponent of SDKM is stuck with this, you'll see how we'll be able to move pretty naturally to the suggestion that such a view isn't going to make sense of psychological review. So, let's look now at the, the first part of this argument. So there's two steps to the argument. Here's the first step. So group A believes that P only if A's members act as if P. Where does this follow from? This follows directly from the joint acceptance account of belief, the Gilbert style model of belief. So group A believes that P only if its members act as if P. Premise two, A can acquire, so group A can acquire the belief that not P only if at least one individual performs some action that causally contributes to A's acquiring the belief that not P. Right? The group just can't just sit there and do nothing and suddenly acquire the belief that not P. So by reference to the group member action principle, A can acquire the belief that not P only if one member does something that 
some action that causally contributes to A's acquiring the belief in not B. Now, the third premise is that any such action in 2 is acting, is not acting as if B, in a way that's going to be in violation of uh, JAB. So therefore, if A acquires the belief that not B, it's not the case that A retains its group belief that B. Obviously, there's, there's other interesting implications of the fact that we get this result from combining the joint account of belief with G member, with the group member action principle. But for right now, let's just take this, and I'm going to use this. You can see where you can go from here to the idea that psychological defeat can't be made sense of. Um, here's the rest of the argument. A proponent of, uh, well, here's how it works. First premise, group A's belief that not B can function as a psychological defeater for A's belief that P. Only if A acquires the belief that not P while attaining A's belief that P. And actually, in not P can be some, some belief that counts against P only while retaining A's belief that P. Uh, and here's, here's a reason to think that this premise is true. Uh, suppose that I believe that the Knicks are going to win at T1, but stop believing this at T2. And then I acquire at T3 the belief that the Knicks will not win. In this case, my belief that not the Knicks will not win at T3 is not a psychological defeater for my belief that the Knicks will win at T1, right? What happened was I believe the Knicks would win. I quit having that belief. And then later, I formed another belief. So that's why premise one is true. Premise two, if A acquires the belief that not P, it's not the case that A retains its group belief that P. And this is just the conclusion that we just reached from the previous first step of the argument. That's really, that's just what's in bold right there that followed, I'm claiming, right, from JAB and GMAP. That's premise two. And so, from premise one and premise two right here, we get the conclusion that therefore A's belief that not P cannot be a psychological defeater for A's original belief that P. But that's bad, right? Because you have to make sense of psychological defeat. It doesn't look like, doesn't look like uh, the moderate view, provided that the moderate view endorsed those background claims that a lot of people who endorse the moderate view embrace. Um, it looks like they're going to be stuck with that result. Um, what, do you, what do you do at this point? So it looks like the moderate view can't make any sense of psychological defeaters, at least. Right now we've only considered psychological defeaters. At least if the moderate view is endorsed alongside the popular joint account of belief, joint acceptance account of belief, and the group member action principle. Well, how do we get out of that argument? How do you get out of the conclusion? Well, one way would be to re reject the group member action principle. Well, that doesn't sound very promising. Um, what about rejecting the joint acceptance account of belief? Obviously, that was one of the things that led to that result. So that's one way to get out of it. And in fact, there is some wiggle room here. So there's a mean-sounding position, which is rejectionism. The leader of the rejectionists is, well, one strong rejectionist is Anthony Myers, who is not on board with the suggestion that groups can have beliefs. And in fact, there's some interesting discussion at the individual level about the relationship between individual beliefs and acceptances. Some of the stuff has been pursued by Joel Proust and Pascal Angel. And what a lot of rejectionists do, and again, rejectionists just means that there aren't group beliefs, there's only group acceptances. What they do is they exploit some of these points in the individual literature about the differences between beliefs and acceptances and say that the things that groups actually have are more like acceptances than, than beliefs. So, Perhaps, right, we could continue to endorse SEKM, the idea that a group can know the P even if no individual member knows the P. Not get the bad result that you can't make sense of psychological defeaters by simply rejecting one of the background commitments that led to that. And so by rejecting JAB, you could just be a rejectionist. And a simple way to think about such a proposal is Raul Hackley who says, all right, there is group knowledge, but I'm a rejectionist, there's no group belief. Group knowledge is justified true acceptance. So when I, a hackily style model of, of SEKM is gonna be, look like that. 
It's going to say a group G can know that P even when not a single individual member of G knows that P. All right, but on this proposal, but not if no individual member of G accepts the P. So can a hackley style rejectionist version of SEKM, the moderate view, make sense of psychological defeat? Obviously, they're already in better position, it looks like, because they don't have to buy into the background view, JAB, that kind of caused the argument to get up and running. Um, now, obviously, a first thing to get out of the way is that if psychological defeat is essentially defined in terms of belief, then SEKM can't resort to rejectionism about belief in order to make sense of it. Um, but let's grant charitably that the rejectionist proponent of SEKM could count as making sense of psychological defeat provided that they can preserve this. That group S's knowledge that P can be, let's call it, quasi-psychologically defeated by S's acceptance that not P. That's just, that's like what a defeater might plausibly look like on a model like what Hackley defends where group knowledge is justified through acceptance. I have justified through acceptance that P. Oh no, uh, we now accept that not P. That would be sort of the analog of a psychological defeat, at least on a charitable way of reading this. Um, unfortunately, though, for a proponent of the Hackley style view, we can run just a similar kind of argument, a variation on the one that we just saw. Um, premise one Group A accepts that P. Notice I'm using the language of acceptance, I'm just plugging in accepts for beliefs for the rejectionist. Group A accepts that P only if A's members accept that P. Sorry, act as if P. And that would be something that a rejectionist would accept. Because rejectionists are not troubled by joint commitment approaches to acceptance. Purpose two, A can acquire the acceptance that not P, and this follows from GMAP, right? Only if at least one individual performs some action that causally contributes to A's acquiring the acceptance that not P. And then run the argument the same way. Any such action in two is not acting as if P. Therefore, if A acquires the acceptance that not P, it's not the case that A retains its group acceptance that P. And then you can just run the rest of the argument the rest of the way uh, and say that an acceptance that not P can function as a quasi-psychological defeater for an acceptance that P only if A acquires the acceptance that not P while retaining its acceptance to P. But that was the, exactly the result of the previous step of the argument that uh, constitutes the next premise. Um, namely, if A acquires the acceptance that not P, it's not the case that A retains its group acceptance to P. And that's just the conclusion from the previous argument. Therefore, A's acceptance that P cannot be a quasi-psychological defeater for A's original acceptance that P. So it looks like, even if you're a rejectionist, and you try to get out of the argument by saying there aren't JAB isn't true. You still face a modified version of this argument that a rejectionist version of the moderate view is going to be able to make sense of psychological defeat. And that's a fact. So now it looks like normal mainstream thinking about group belief and collective epistemology when coupled with a moderate proposal about group knowledge can't make sense of psychological defeaters. How knowledge, group knowledge would be defeated through ordinary mechanisms of psychological defeat. And if you quit endorsing the mainstream view and take a rejectionist line and say there are group beliefs, you still can't make sense of psychological defeaters on the moderate model. So that's not looking very good. So it's looking at this point that SEKM isn't actually faring a lot better than the more radical proposal did, that Lackey attacked, insofar as its prospects are looking for making sense of psychological defeat. <coughs> but you might think, well, maybe SEKM can make sense of normative defeat, even if it can't make sense of psychological defeat, and making sense of one type of defeat isn't so bad. You can imagine someone saying that. Um, so let's ask, what about normative defeat? Well, remember what a normative defeater is, is at the individual level. It's a doubt or a belief that S ought to have, that you ought to have, that indicates that the target belief is either false or unreliably formed or sustained, and it defeats in virtue of being a belief that you ought to have. And here's what I think a, a group version of a normative defeater would possibly look like if we transpose the idea of normative defeat to groups. 
a group normative to fear for group A is a belief that P is some belief that A ought to have, that Q, where Q indicates that A is a belief that P is either false or unreliably formed or sustained. So I'm going to now offer an argument. See if I'm uncomfortable um, with the idea that group groups on the moderate proposal can make sense of normative defeat. I'm going to at least highlight the reason why I feel this way. And I'm going to present as clearly as I can. We'll see if you buy it. So the argument essentially is going to be that SEKM can't account for normative defeat um, so long as you grant the group member action principle, GMAP, the joint account of belief, the mainstream way to think about group belief, and a further background claim about the nature of the kind of ought that features a normative defeat. So from these background claims, we're going to get the result that the moderate proposal, SEKM, can't make sense of normative defeat. Now, this is a tricky issue, and I'm going to at least make it clear where I stand on it for the purposes of the talk, and um, hopefully you'll get the gist of it. This is a point that Richard Feldman has made about the nature of the epistemic ought when talking specifically about what you hear evidentialists say all the time, which is that you ought to believe in accordance with your evidence. Well, what is, the, what is the type of ought that's in play? You ought to believe in accordance with your evidence. Here's Richard Feldman. Feldman says, if the oughts in question are supposed to be means to goals that people actually have, then it seems that only people who have the epi certain epistemic goals would be subject to the relevant epistemic requirements. However, Feldman says, the claim that one ought to believe in accordance with one's evidence is not restricted in that way. It says that all people epistemically ought to follow their evidence, not just those who have adopted some specifically epistemic goals. So this is one way of thinking about the difference between the ought of instrumental rationality and the ought of epistemic rationality. Um, most people think that practical rationality has something to do with instrumental rationality, something a lot to do with it, which is means end rationality. And it seems, right, and clearly Feldman reveals that he thinks that epistemic rationality is a different type of thing in the respect that our oughts don't function simply out of adopting particular goals. And here's Peter Railton with a similar remark. There's also one quote by Tom Kelly I considered using, but this, is, this one gets to the heart of it, I think, as well, with respect to talking about epistemic reasons. On the usual view of things, two agents in the same epistemic situation would have the same reason for believing any given proposition, regardless of possible differences in their personal goals. Well, this seems pretty plausible. This is at least a way of something that is often taken for granted in talking about epistemic reasons and epistemic odds. So here's all I want to say. This is very, there's very complicated stuff that value theorists argue about, <coughs> particularly regarding what is more basic. So here's an idea I think is pretty plausible. A group can agree to accept P by agreeing to act as if P in the following qualified way. The group can agree to act as if P across a range of circumstances that positively correlates with the group's epistemic position, which is a position that the individuals of the group agree to and are thus obligated, qua members of the group, to update in systematic ways. So I have say a lot more about this in a paper in which I'm talking about group knowledge and disagreement, but for now that's kind of the punchline of the view. So I think that once we take on board something like this, there's a way to make sense of psychological defeat. And a normative defeat turns out to be a little bit harder, but there's also a way to sort of make sense of normative defeat. Um, so we'll say group psychological defeaters function right by virtue of being had, by having the beliefs or whatever they are, and counting in some way against the group's and this is, how, this is how my line would go if you endorse the type of risk-responsive account of belief that I was suggesting. They function in virtue of being had and counting in some way against the groups continuing to hold the belief in the way it is held and regardless of the truth value or epistemic status of the defeater. Now, key to the way that I think that you could potentially make sense of psychological defeat on the moderate account SEKM that embraces my account of belief is that individual updates on the risk responsiveness model can count against holding the belief in the way it is held and so can defeat belief in this sense and regardless of whether the individual updates or somebody crying wolf. Um, and here's an example that I think will help. So let's consider a case of a rebutting psychological defeater on the type of model that I'm suggesting. Suppose that an individual of the group, M, 
updates that the practical risk is high when previously G is presently acting as if P in levels of up to only medium level risk? Well, A's update defeats holding the belief in that particular way, namely the way in which they would act as if P um, in levels of uh, continue acting as if P, because right now the thought is that the risk would be high and it's going to act as if P up to levels of medium risk. Um, we can also imagine an example of an undercutting defeater uh, on this type of model I'm suggesting. An idea would be, imagine, I don't know, on a crew of a ship, imagine an individual in the group M updates that co-team member M star who's in charge of entering some data is disgruntled and trying to maybe sabotage the data entry. This would be an under, a type of undercutting defeater. When you find out that one member of the team isn't functioning well, then that leads you to worry that the process right, that produces the target output is one that is not reliably sustained because one of the uh, members that's responsible for entering data is doing it in a bad way. This is sort of analogous right, to learning that I've, at the individual level, have peyote in my iron group. I have reason to think that the process that's leading to the output is not a good one. Um, and a similar move can be made with respect to uh, normative defeat. Um, I will actually, because I'm over time, I will just stop here, and that's pretty much the uh, pretty much the end. So thank you for your attention, and look forward to.